Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, my guest is Mark Newton from Newton Advisors. We're going to talk about the market environment. Right now, we have this situation with the S&P really pulling back in the, uh, the afternoon session. The NASDAQ leading the way further down, but small caps really uh, moving down aggressively with the S&P 600 down almost 3.5%. What does that mean for the overall leadership rotation and the big picture? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we make sense of these markets together. The market's certainly in distribution mode today. What started in the last hour of yesterday's trading really consider uh, continuing through the course of the day. Choppy in the first half, selling off in the second half. We're going to get to all of that and more. I did want to take just a brief moment and say congratulations to my mother, Joe Keller, who just finished her final treatment for breast cancer yesterday. Super proud of her, excited for her, and thankful. And we have some great guests coming up, as I mentioned. We have uh, Mark Newton joining us from Newton Advisors later today. Tomorrow, we have Samantha LaDuke from LaDuke Trading. On uh, Thursday, Doug Bush from Chart Smarter in New York. Coming up next week on Tuesday the 30th, we have David Auerbach from the Daily Repeat. We have JC O'Hara on Wednesday the 31st. Uh, from MKM Partners in the New York area. So it's super uh, appreciative of all the guests we have coming through, guys like Mark Newton and others have so much to offer to uh, to help us make sense of these things. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to all of that in the coming days and weeks. We want to start out our market recap with a poll. We asked all of you recently, what's your average investment horizon? And I gave you four choices, a couple minutes, a couple days, a couple weeks, or a couple months. And if that sounds kind of unscientific and uh, broad for you, that's by design, that's how I usually talk about time horizons. When people talk about a very specific horizon, I am aiming for six months. I found the markets never really play nicely with a, a very specific particular time horizon that you may have in mind. And I also think you want to be flexible, right? If you're aiming for six months down the road or three months down the road and something happens in month one that tells you things are different and that you need to change your perspective, I hope you think about that and, and recognize the relationship uh, between the short-term movements and the long-term trends. I think that's how successful investors remain successful is being able to adapt and all that. Having said uh, that, uh, over half of you, 55% said your average investment horizon is a couple months. About 30% of you said a couple of weeks and the rest were uh, shorter term from that. That's about what I would have expected. That's great. Now, here's the, the point of this question, the reason why I asked it. If you did answer in that bucket a, a couple months, I hope you remember that what happens a couple of weeks at a time or in a couple of days or in a couple of minutes certainly impacts your uh, time horizon. Don't think that you can just ignore what's going on and focus on a couple of months and be well prepared for that sort of time horizon. On the other hand, if you are a short-term swing trader or day trader, looking at minutes or hours or days at a time, make sure you properly focus on the long-term trends, the big picture, the weekly charts, at least at some point during your week, because that'll help you understand how the short-term environment that you're operating in, a lot of that is going to be impacted by big institutions that are operating on a very different time frame. Understanding the interplay of those time frames, I would argue, is one of the most important things you can do as an investor. Thanks for answering that question, everyone. Let's continue with our uh, market recap. As I mentioned, um, you know, distribution day for sure. The S&P down about three quarters of a percent, 39.10 uh, is about the, uh, the close of the day. Most of that uh, sell-off came uh, after around 1 to 2 p.m., as you saw some distribution here. The NASDAQ a little further now, but mid caps and then small caps are really the story. The small cap index, the S&P 600, down about three and a half percent today. It's quite a move. Uh, and again, this is not the first day that that's happened. We've seen a trend in uh, small caps here. This is the uh, IWM 
the Russell 2000 ETF, a little different, but uh, but same idea. You know, this sell-off that you've seen today, this is today's bar there in, uh, in green. This is after about a week and a half of overall distribution. We've had some bounces along the way there, but you've really seen the, uh, the Russell 2000 come off of uh, all-time highs there uh, about a week and a half ago and then really distributing. What's encouraging about this chart is that it's not making new lows yet. Even with the distribution on a day like today, which feels severe, you're not even below the lows from, uh, from uh, early March, right? You're still remaining in an overall positive trend. I think this sort of distribution is, is gonna shake a lot of people out, at least mentally uh, from, uh, from what's been going on here. The question is, is that sort of move, move sustainable? I think there's, uh, there's a corrective pattern that we're in. I think we'll see more weakness from, uh, from different ETFs and different indexes, but overall, uh, the market uh, uh, should should resolve this uh, whole experience to the upside. The question is how long that's going to take and how much pain we need to feel first. The VIX, by the way, back up above 20. 10-year yields back below 1.7%. Uh, that happened yesterday, continuing lower today with the TLT, which we usually use for bond prices, up almost 1%, and the dollar index uh, continuing higher. Gold continuing weaker. Silver down uh, almost 3% or just over 3% today, which is a pretty big move. Energy uh, also struggling as oil prices came off pretty well. US, USO down almost 6% today. So a rotation away from commodities, uh, a rotation away from most things today. Very few things up. The dollar, uh, one of those that, uh, that comes to mind. Cryptocurrencies, by the way, uh, up as well with Bitcoin up. Not a ton uh, by crypto standards, up 1.5%, uh, but overall, most of these Top 10 uh, most liquid ETFs, uh, coins, or sorry, coins that we follow uh, in the green today. Let's focus on a chart of the S&P 500. I did uh, an interview this morning and was asked about just the overall trend. And, you know, again, what encourages me about this chart is the fact that we keep making higher highs and we keep making higher lows overall, right? So if you look from 2021, the beginning, the first three months here, we're almost done with the first quarter, we've seen a successive pattern of higher highs. If you look at the January, February, March highs, every month we have made a new all-time high, that's impressive. Every month we have also managed to make a new uh, higher low, right? So. Uh, here in the end of January, you uh, pulled back to around 3,700. We didn't even make it down to there in early March. That's all positive. What concerns me on this chart, the reason why I'm not ecstatically telling you that the market's going to rip higher from here, is this line at the bottom, the RSI. If you look at the momentum on stocks, every time the S&P has moved to higher highs, the momentum has made lower peaks. So higher prices on weaker momentum is not the sign of a healthy bull market. It's the sign of a market at an exhaustion point or nearing an exhaustion point, a, a market where momentum is coming out of it. Now, it's not just on that chart that you're seeing uh, that sort of uh, you, that sort of divergence, right? If you look at the semiconductor index, SMH, this is a chart we highlighted uh, many times in the last uh, month, but this higher high in price, lower peaks in RSI, this is the signal for us that the, the technology growth trade was waning that uh, that the market was uh, going to a new high on weaker momentum that was not sustainable. Since then, semiconductors have undercut their January low. While the S&P has remained above, semiconductors, a lot of tech names actually undercut it. I would argue there's still more pain to be had with semiconductors before all is uh, said and done. If you look at a chart like JP Morgan, arguably right now, you're getting a similar sort of pattern. This looks like semiconductors a month ago where you had higher highs in price you have lower peaks in momentum. So some of these high-flying groups recently, like financials, even some energy stocks, you're getting these bearish divergences, which uh, signal or, or, or indicate likely trend exhaustion. So you know, while that does not necessarily mean the market experiences another you know, January, February of 2020, it's not necessarily saying we're going to have another huge major top, although it's worth noting that December, January, February, and semiconductors looked a lot like uh, sort of uh, January, February of 2021, a lot of similarities between those two, uh, those two patterns for sure. Um, so again, it's, it, it could happen. Uh, absolutely. For me, what would tell me that happens is if you stocks, you have stocks breaking down, not just not going up anymore, which is where a lot of names are. It's whether they start breaking support. What concerns me, which makes me not super uh, optimistic about stocks in the near term is the fact that semiconductors have already broken down through their January low. And what that means for me is I see this bounce that we've seen as a bounce before the next move lower and not just the bottom that is now resolving back to the upside. I don't see downside exhaustion signals yet on the, on the semiconductor chart. I could be completely proven wrong if we continue to appreciate 
and stocks start to uh, to work. But I'm I am more surprised by days like yesterday when semiconductors do so well, and or the day before, and less surprised by a, a day like today when semiconductors are coming off two and a half percent. Because I think that makes sense for the overall structure that we're seeing in uh, in stocks. That was a bit of a rant on overall market dynamics, but I hope that made sense for everyone. Looking very quickly here at the other themes before we take a break. Um, uh, in terms of sector leadership, very defensive on the top here. You have utilities, number one, consumer staples. And it's funny when you look at a chart of uh, like General Mills, GIS, um, it's actually not a bad chart, uh, which is kind of funny to think because this is a stock I don't think of as leadership and I don't think of as outperforming. But if you look at the month of March, it's done both of those things. It's accelerated out of uh, a pretty depressed level. The relative strength has been positive through the course of the month, just recently overbought. So this pullback that you see makes a ton of sense because it was overbought, because it, meet, it met uh, excuse me, previous resistance there from November, even back in October, and also that uh, same level in January. So kind of at that point, the upper end of this range. If that changes, if we get above 62 uh, and, uh, and il illustrate some follow through after a brief pullback, I'd be much more of a believer in a name like this. Um, however, what you know, what I'm seeing is more of a de defensive name that hasn't really done much, especially on a relative basis over the long term at the upper end of a range. It doesn't get me super excited, but making a higher low on a pullback, breaking above 62, sort of following through to the upside, signaling that this wasn't just a fluke, but more of a longer term trend that's beginning. That would be of, uh, of interest to me. I think Goldman, uh, sorry, I'm not Goldman Sachs, uh, GIS General Mills has a little more to prove before I believe on, uh, on, on, on much further upside from here. That's our market recap for today. We need to take a quick commercial break back with Mark Newton from Newton Advisors. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. So good to have you join us every weekday after the close as we make sense of these markets together using the power of data visualization, using the power of charts. I was talking uh, earlier this, uh, this week, yesterday, with the management team at StockCharts, uh, Chip Anderson, our founder, Grayson Rose, and, uh, and others talking about uh, you know, different visualizations and where we're headed and, and again, reflected on the benefit or the, the power that I, I think active investors have now, the, the uh, capabilities you have uh, <laughs> relative to a time like uh, my conversation with Walter Diemer, I interviewed him for Behind the Charts that ran on uh, Monday of this week. And you, you hear what the role of the chartist was in the 1960s and 70s. And I'm, I'm so thankful that we have the capabilities we do now just to analyze and understand markets through so much data that's available to us. So Hope you can take advantage of that and uh, and use the power of, uh, of charting, of technical analysis, of stock charts to do that. As a reminder, we run a mailbag segment twice a week. We'll do another one a little later in today's show. Shoot us an email, the final bar at stockcharts.com with questions that come up in your normal routine, and we would love to answer them on the air. I want to welcome on my guest, Mark Newton. Mark's the founder of Newton Advisors based in the uh, New York area. His work I followed for a number of years back through uh, Diamondback and uh, and Morgan Stanley before that, but now uh, running your own shop successfully. Mark, thanks for coming back on the show. Yeah, thanks very much for having me back, Dave. It's great to be back at Stock Charts. So, uh, you know, clearly the market is in rotation. You have days like, uh, you know, the last two days where it felt like everything's great. Things are back to normal. Growth is working. And then you have today where it's more of a reversion right back to the downside. We're starting looking at um, this this idea of small versus large, which I, I know is an area that a lot of people are focused on. What are you seeing looking at small cap versus large cap here? Yeah, interestingly enough, we have gotten to a juncture where I think it's going to be a lot more difficult to make money in small caps in the near term. Now, this is a weekly chart of IWM, Russell 2000 versus the S&P, uh, going back since it peaked out in early 2014. And so you see that on the upper part of the chart, there's a number of different uh, former peaks that it's hit. And uh, literally the right-hand side of the chart shows you the extent of the acceleration just since November up to the recent peak. I mean, we've literally recaptured about 80% of all the damage that's been done in small caps uh, just literally in the last few months. So there's been an incredible ease of making money in a lot of these smaller price stocks. And just small caps in general have 
you know, radically outperformed as a lot of the large cap tech have sort of floundered. But now I think we're, we're you know, if anything, the last couple of days have shown us that we're seeing a little bit of a comeback in large cap tech, while the smaller cap and also mid cap indices are starting to roll over again. So yet again, you know, we see a lot of rotation at work. And, how, you know, when you're looking at this chart, Mark, how much of this is risk on versus risk off when you see, see small caps, you know, rally and then and then roll over versus the sector part of it, right? You have, you know, more things like financials in, in the small cap index that yeah. would impact it. You know, what? how would you weight the two of those? Is it just a risk on versus risk off or more of a sector leadership rotation story for you? You know, I think it really is sector rotation. A lot of this is financials, which you know, started to accelerate once yields bottomed last August. And so that is a large part of this along with energy and both of those groups have shown tremendous outperformance. And so if anything, you know, we see the 6% decline in crude oil today, crude getting a little stretched. Uh, it means to me like you might see a rotation out of financials and energy in the short run. And, and that could coincide with things like treasuries bottoming out after a huge mm -hmm. move up in yields. And so, you know, there, there are things that make me think that, uh, you know, the, the small cap trade has gotten a little bit over its skis and, and that we need to pull back. And so this is a longer term chart. Obviously, for those that wish to pull up shorter term, you're, you're seeing that same rotation, you know, at work in the last few days, you've seen things start to show real divergences and starting to roll over. And, and you know, my thinking is a lot of the market's been working in tandem. And, and now that's starting to shift. You're seeing definite rotation um, you know, technology has been sort of camouflaging the market for a long time and in both directions. You look and see the markets up, but yet most of the sectors are down uh, and, and vice versa. And so this is just one piece of the puzzle. But it means to me, like, you're, you're likely going to see a move out of uh, small caps and mid caps, uh, at least in the short run, I meaning probably at least the next four to six weeks. Now, you mentioned growth and, and uh, here we're going to look a, a little bit at technology. And I, and I think a lot of people have struggled with the fact that technology, which has been leadership for the longest time, really, you know, weaker in the last uh, in the last couple yeah. months. What are you seeing right now looking at tech? So I like to look at the equal weighted technology ETF or RYT, because we do have such a uh, dominant part of technology that's ruled by Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google and Facebook. And so. This is just the RYT relative to the RSP or the equal weighted S&P. So it really serves to strip out a lot of the large cap influence. And so this really peaked out uh, last spring and it's been really sideways with regards to the broader tech space with, you know, we have rallies and declines, but in general tech as a sector has not nearly been as uh, strong as a, an equal weighted group. And it's really been sort of the dominance of large caps that have helped it to rally. Fall. So you see that recent peak in mid-February, that's when technology fell off dramatically. We fell through the lows of this little consolidation. So this brought equal weighted technology in relative terms to the lowest levels we've seen in over a year. So I, I do think that's a warning sign. Uh, technically, I think that means you're going to start to see some mean reversion out of technology, whether it be because of you know the political battle and the left versus right or what have you. But momentum gauges like RSI and even MACD, which is shown below, Although it's an oscillator, it did reach the lowest levels that we've seen in over a year. So I do think that's meaningful. The last couple of days have shown it turn up a little bit. And so this is a short-term bounce in technology, which has served to, yet again, camouflage the market because we saw discretionary and financials fall off today. Tech was the one that sort of held the market together. And of course, the market sort of fell apart. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. Just serves to uh, note that the tech, I believe, has uh, started a longer-term uh, downside rotation that it should see flows out of tech over the next 12 to 24 months. That's a great take, Mark. Appreciate you talking through uh, some charts with us, sharing your uh, your perspective and putting things into uh, into context. Thanks for coming on the show. Hope you and uh, those around you stay safe and we'll talk to you again soon. My pleasure, Dave. Thanks for having me. Take care. That's Mark Newton from Newton Advisors. And, uh, and again, it's, you know, when you think about things like uh, rotation, when you think about small versus large, when you think about tech versus financials, all these different things. I, you know, what I, what I love about Mark's work, particularly some of those things you showed you, all ratio charts trying to represent the relationship between these two. I think it's very easy to get caught up into, you know, the short-term movements, the day-to-day -day movements and what's working and what isn't. Looking at these ratios over the longer term can really help you understand, you know, the, the, where some of these uh, themes have come from. And, the rally in small caps, it, you know, looking at that first chart really 
uh, help that the beginning of uh, really the last six months or so makes sense in terms of how severe that was from when small caps have been out of favor for, for the longest time, really. I mean, right, it was really a, a FANG-led market. It was not too long ago. All we were talking about were the FANG stocks and the market rallies just because of the FANG names, how much things have changed uh, since then. But certainly a, a cautious, uh, more defensive tone from, uh, from some of Mark's uh, charts there is, uh, is worth noting. Let's continue on to our next segment called the Final Bar Mailbag. What we love to do is hear from you. As a reminder, we are here to answer your questions at any point. We'd love to answer one of your questions on the air. Shoot us an email with anything that comes up as you're analyzing your own charts, things you see online, on social media, in articles, on uh, videos, whatever it is. Nothing's out of bounds. Just let us know what you're uh, what you're thinking. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is our email. We'd love to hear from you. Chart number one, uh, let's see. I do not agree with your guess. This is from uh, last week, I want to say. I do not agree with your guess that option activity will diminish over time. I think that was uh, Jason Geffert talking about the rise in uh, speculation using some charts with, uh, with options data. I'm not an expert, but I think option investing is the new trend. Also, as the interest rates rise, will the dollar go up? I noted stock charts uses UUP and DXY. I want to know the reason for using UUP. You asked about a lot of different things on there. I'll... Uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to hit on as much of that as I uh, as I as I can. Now, on your last chart, right? So when you when you look at things, what I've found is with uh, it's all about where you're getting the data from, and the dollar index that we use is called uh, dollar sign USD. And you can see when you're looking at the candle glance page, from for example, a lot of these will will have in parentheses EOD. That means end of day, which means at the end of the day, at the close, we get updated data for that index, and we're able to track it. So if you're looking at a long term relationship of the dollar, gold, crude oil, things like that, copper, um, using those end of day indexes is totally fine because you're trying to understand the long term trends, and it's much better to use that as the as the um, you know representation of something like the dollar or crude oil prices. In the short term, though, if you want to understand what's happening day to day during you know minute to minute during the day, you can use ETFs. They're a perfect proxy for uh, most of those things. It's just tradable versions tracking those indexes to some degree. So we use the UUP because it's an ETF that tracks the dollar and it updates during the day. Same thing like with crude oil, I would use USO. With the gold, I'd use GLD uh, and all of those. The problem with those is the further you go along, if you go back a year, the chart of USO is going to look more and more different from the crude oil chart because they're not one-to-one. -one. There's, a, there's a decay that's built into some futures. There's a rollover on how you roll over contracts and all that actually impacts the ETF. So in the short term, they will match their movements very, very closely or the long term, they become a little more disconnected. So during the day, if I just want to see what worked and what didn't, I will use those ETFs to track it over the longer term. Uh, I will use um, uh, I will use the, uh, the the indexes or the futures. You know your question about interest rates in the dollar. Yeah, so for me, I have this intermarket analysis list where I where I uh, have all of those different uh, indexes. And for example, we talked a lot about the rise in interest rates. You can see the TNX here on the left side and how it's accelerated in the last um, you know in the last six months. Uh, you can see the dollar index over here, and you can see for much of the last year, we've had a stronger, you know, uh, rising rates, we've had a weaker dollar. But if you look what's happened in the last three months, you've had uh, a, a change in relationship, you've had a stronger dollar, and you've had higher rates. So I would caution you to make a very specific linear relationship. When interest rates do X, what does the dollar do? You can come up with average relationships, but uh, you know, spending time with Bob Prechter kind of ruined those one-on-one -on -one relationships I learned. And he reminds you that it's not a simple mechanism. It's not security A and security B, and there's a direct relationship. All of these things are happening amongst all these other things, things like inflation and interest rates and the Fed and risk assessment, all of that impact these different assets. And it's not a direct relationship as much as you might think. Next question, uh, Dave, uh, let's see, if I have a chart list and I want to review the ATR, the average true range for each of the stocks on a weekly basis, is there a way to get the information in a table format so I don't have to flip through each chart? So the short answer is no. Um, the only way you can do that on our platform is by looking through the charts individually. I would argue with something like ATR, that's something I'd much rather see on the individual charts. However, I totally get the essence of your question, which is wanting to find a tabular version of that. The good news on that is the long-term answer is going to be yes, we're actually talking about building out some of our reporting capabilities, some screening tools to allow you to manage a list of, uh, of securities 
a little more easily and filter through them. Our chart list feature brings in some data. So there are some things you want to do. ATR is not one of those items, but our new reporting feature that we're, uh, that we're designing uh, will certainly do that. If you want to get an idea of what it kind of might look like, um, let's see how quickly I can get to this. I don't know if I actually can. Um, I'm not going to try to embarrass myself by doing it. We actually have a panel. I don't know if I can show you in this version of it, but we have a panel that we are working up on the bottom of ACP. Uh, and, uh, and you can actually bring up that panel and bring in some tabular data. It's very limited right now, but we'll be able to bring those capabilities also inside the regular stock charts platform coming soon, hopefully. Next question, uh, I've been holding IWC, that's the microcap ETF as it was moving up and outperforming SPY. Um, I didn't show that yet, but that is on this uh, chart list, I believe. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, I don't have it on here, but I'll bring up uh, this one and I'll switch it to IWC. This is a microcap ETF that you're talking about. And this is the last uh, last stretch of performance. If you look uh, similar to the small cap chart, you can see the relative strength really going uh, up over the last six months as it's uh, it's outperformed. It seems that IWC and IWM are no longer outperforming the SPY. Am I understanding that small caps lead out of down periods? Does the fact that they seem to have stopped their upward move for now, at least looking at those ratios, um, uh, oh, it seems they've stopped their upward move. Is there a way to know if there's a sideways move that will resume or whether the outperformance is over for this part of the cycle? So that was a very a great great way to ask the question that I sort of posed with Mark Newton earlier. It's, it's, it's great that you asked that question. I asked him about that ratio because he was looking at the ratio of small versus large and you see how it had rallied so beautifully and now starting to come off a little bit. And you're seeing the same thing in the IWC chart, the microcap ETF, higher highs in price, Lower peaks in RSI, you're seeing the same thing with the small cap ETF, the relative strength of the RS, uh, sorry, the relative strength line here looking at IWC versus the S&P 500 had outperformed for a while and now more sideways, more stable. And the question is, what's next? I, there's no you know, beautiful way to predict whether it's going to be more of a sideways choppy move or whether it's going to be a, a deep pullback. Uh, I think Mark's comments were, were absolutely right in that it's not just about small and micro cap. It's also about the sector leadership. So when you get further down in the cap here, it's less and less technology which is and consumer, which is dominated in the large cap index. It's more things like financials and some energy and others that have a bigger weight. So when those sectors are struggling, you will find the small and mid cap indexes struggling as a result of that because of the sectors that are represented by those indexes. I think there's going to be more, uh, more pain to be had, more choppiness. I see a lot of uh, sort of warning signs with the overall market activity. And I think these divergences in small and mid cap, or sorry, small and micro caps are, are part of that overall picture. Um, overall, my thesis for 2021 has been a choppy, volatile year that ends higher. And I'm not seeing anything yet that tells me to expect anything otherwise. I'm I'm more less concerned about steeper downside from here and more concerned with limited upside. And that that's what I would uh, I would see overall. That's all the time we have for the the uh, the mailbag segment. Thank you guys so much for sending in those questions. Keep them coming. The final bar at stockcharts.com. We would love to hear from you. We need to wrap the show. Go to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is Tesla. I was asked earlier in an interview what the long-term trends uh, on Tesla, and I was, uh, you know, the, the long-term target of 3,000. The challenge I have with that, that's a long way from where we're at. But if you look at where we were a year ago, we basically had that similar type of move uh, going from 150 up to 700 or so. Um, so that's not unreasonable. However, I think there's a lot of pain that needs to be overcome. And I'm seeing a trend of lower highs and lower lows in Tesla. I would wanna see that stop before I would get too excited on that. Chart number two is the Russell 2000. I mentioned with the micro cap index, higher highs in price, lower momentum. You're seeing the same thing on small caps, which concerns me as well. I think breaking down through this trend line and then the swing lows from January would signal a very much risk off scenario. We're not quite there yet, which tells me it's more corrective at this point. Finally, the chart of silver, precious metals struggling today. I think overall gold prices have come down so much. It's tempting to take a nibble of some sort. With silver prices though, I'm seeing it test its 200 day moving average and the Fibonacci support line, the 38.2% uh, line just above 21. Uh, so I'd be certainly looking to see if silver is able to hold that. If it is, overall, this could be an actionable pullback within a longer term uptrend. If it breaks 21, uh, even 2050, I'd be concerned about further downside. Folks, that is our show for today. Special thank you to Mark Newton from Newton Advisors for joining us from New York. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. 
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.